respected Thai, dear Sangha, tomorrow some of us will have to go home. So we maybe uh, already have some ideas of how we are going to practice when we come home. Or maybe we think we don't need to have any ideas of how we're going to practice because we know that what we've already been practicing here will continue when we go home. That we call the non-practice practice. <laughs> you don't have to think about it. It just comes naturally. I have been doing the non-practice practice of the non-toothache. <laughs> it just comes naturally. But I don't know how many days more it will become natural for me. Because I have bad toothache for two days. And uh, yesterday the dentist was able to remove the toothache. So now I am feeling very happy not to have toothache. I don't have to practice in order to feel that happiness. It's somehow my brain, it just feels happy not to have to have toothache. But in a few days' time, my brain won't feel happy about the non-toothache anymore. It will think that having non-toothache is just something normal. It's not worth feeling happy about. <laughs> so there are so many things in our life that we don't feel is worth feeling happy about. And it is the role of our mind consciousness that we learned yesterday to be able to remind ourselves of what things we can feel happy about in the present moment. The fact that I have uh, two eyes that are working, I have an optic nerve which is getting into touch with the other parts of my brain. This can bring me so many wonderful forms and wonderful colors at any time that I open my eyes. It's something very, very precious and something really worth feeling happy about. We can also use our past suffering in order to feel happy. In Plum Village, we talk about the three times into R. The three times are the past, the present, and the future. In some schools of Buddhism, they say, that all the times exist. The past exists, the present exists, the future exists, but they exist separately. In Plum Village, the three times <coughs> they exist, but they exist in each other. The future and the past are in the present. So when I feel the non <laughs> the happiness of the non-toothache, that happiness is also there because of the past. So the past and the present inter are. So we practice uh, sometimes that we remember a very difficult or not so difficult situation that we were in. And now we're not in that situation and we immediately feel happy. You may be lying on your bed, unable to sleep, and you think how miserable this is, not being able to sleep. But then you remember when you were on a flight to Australia, and you have to sit up all night, and it was very unpleasant. You just wish for one thing, if only I could lie down. And now you're lying on your bed and you don't feel happy. <laughs> so the, the suffering of the, of the past, it can make you happy in the present moment. We can use that. So the present and the past, they inter are. And there is a, the, also the present and the future inter are. Um, one time uh, I said to one sister, uh, I said, what are you doing? You should be in the Dharma sharing now. And she said, hmm, I'm, um, I'm cutting wood <laughs> to store up for the winter. Uh, so I, I knew what she meant because I remember that 
Dharma talk when Thay told us that uh, you don't wait until the snow is on the ground in order to cut the wood and bring it in. You do that in the autumn or in the summer. You find your dead tree in the wood, you cut it down, you bring it in, you chop it up, and you have it ready to light the fire when it's cold in the winter. So I say that practicing happiness in the present moment is like that. It's like preparing yourself for a time when things will be difficult. And my sister knew that uh, things were going to be difficult for her. She came to a point in her life where things were going to be difficult. And so instead of going to the Dharma sharing, she was practicing walking meditation, uh, enjoying the autumn leaves. And she thought that was the best way in order to store up the wood for the, for the future. Mm. Uh, so today we are supposed to be talking about the three Dharma seals. But the Dharma seal that I just uh, talked about is one of the four Plum Village Dharma seals. Yesterday you heard of two of them, and this one say the three times and the two truths inter are. When you touch the present deeply, you touch the whole of the past and the future. In uh, December last year, my mother died. And uh, at first, I used to think, oh, my mother's not there anymore. And I a little bit regret that uh, she's not there. But in fact, when I look deeply, and I remembered the time that I spent with my mother, she was, she was there. Because that time that we spent together in the past, it was there in the present. The past has not really <coughs> gone anywhere. It's contained in the present. And so after the, someone we love has died, we can be in touch with him or her when we, when we want to. Uh, sometimes we think that the person that we has died is no longer there, and the person who is alive is still there. But in fact, it's not like that. Sometimes the person who is alive, we cannot be in touch with them. But the person who has died, we can be in touch with them in the present moment. So we have to be careful and not to make a big distinction between life and death. Because life is only possible because of, of death. The two things into R. And if we say to ourselves, oh, that person is dead. No, there's no way they can be present in my life anymore. Then you cut yourself off from the presence of that person who really wants you to be there for them, still be there for them. So the Buddha <coughs> tell a very good example of all this uh, 
fact. And there is a merchant who lives with his only son in a village, in a little house. And one day the merchant has to go on a journey somewhere to sell his wares. So he leaves his son at home in the house. And while he's away, the bandits come and they set light to the village. They pillage everything and then set light to the village. And when the merchant comes back, he goes to the place where his house used to be, has now been burnt down, and he sees in the charred remains of the house the remains of a, of a child who's been burnt. And immediately he thinks, this is my boy. My boy has been burnt. He feels tremendous grief. He gathers up the remains and he makes a ceremony, cremation ceremony for the remains, and then puts the ashes in a pouch, which he wears around his neck. And he continues to grieve his son, and he believes that anything that is left of his son, it must be inside that pouch. That's all that's left, the ashes he carries. And one night, late at night, he's sitting grieving for his son, and he hears a knock on the door. And he says, who's there? And his son, Daddy, it's me, let me in. And he's very annoyed. He says, young boy, don't play jokes on me. My son is dead. And the son knocks on the door again and says, Daddy, it's really me. Please, let me in. I want to come home. And the father says, go away. Don't play jokes like that. And the third time, he knocks on the door. And the father sends him away. And then the boy gives up. He doesn't want to try anymore. The son had not died in the fire. The son had only been captured by the bandits. And he'd escaped. And He'd uh, come back, come back to be, and his father missed the opportunity to, to have his son. And we think that we would not be so foolish like that. But in fact, we too, when someone we love, we can't, we say they've died. Uh, we can't find them anymore. But there are ways. We have to play a game. Uh, a game of hide and seek in order to be able to find the one that we that we think we have lost, but in fact we haven't. And of course, uh, your loved one is always in you. You don't have to go very far in order to be able to find him or her. Uh, tai always gives us a wonderful example. It's the example of the... Uh, the pot of tea. It's okay. So uh, you make a pot of tea and you pour the water on the tea leaves and you enjoy the fragrant tea. Now you can enjoy many cups of tea from one pot of tea. But uh, after a time, you need the new tea leaves because the old tea leaves, they have all their uh, tea to be drink, drunk has been used up. So you throw away the old uh, tea leaves. So those tea leaves are a little bit like the ashes uh, that the man uh, carry in the pouch. They, they don't. But what about the tea? The tea that has been uh, drunk and the tea that we can still drink. Yeah. We forget about that and we, we just grieve because the, the tea leaves can't give us any more tea. Yeah. So the practice of the three times into R is a very helpful practice for me. Um, 
It also helps me when I look back over my own life. Sometimes you have done things in the past that you regret. And uh, you think maybe that there's nothing you can do about this. But in fact, the past is still there in the present. And you can, uh, you can do differently in the present. You don't have to do as you did in the past. And that is a way of healing the past by the way you act in the, the present. Uh, so, like you've done something in the past and it's, it's like it's walked away from you. And then you do something else, which is like the opposite of what you regret you did in the past and it catches up with the other thing and they embrace each other and they, uh, they inter are. So the teaching of interbeing is, uh, is a wonderful teaching. It is uh, like a, a key that can uh, that can help us overcome our perceptions, our usual, normal way of looking at things. And when we can overcome those perceptions, we can heal ourselves, we can transform, and we can be liberated. So that's just another one of the... Uh, the Plum Village uh, Dharma Seals. There's one more which I'm not going to talk about, but I better tell you what it is. Huh? Is that uh, consciousness is ripening at every every instant. Yeah, that is something to do with something else we won't talk about today. I can't count. <laughs>
Well, I'm trying to economize on walking up and down. Mm. So, uh, in the Argamas, and also in the in Chinese, and in the Nikaya, in the Pali, you can read a, a sutra. It's called the Chanda Sutra. It's almost identical in both the Pali and Chinese, except for one point. I will tell you about that later. So there is a monk called Chanda. And at this time, the Buddha has passed away. We say the Buddha had uh, entered Nirvana. So, uh, Chanda, he takes refuge in the elders in order to learn about the teaching. He has a deep desire to be liberated and he wants to hear the teachings which can liberate him. So at that time he's living in the, the deer park in Saranath. Yeah. And uh, he, in the early morning he gets up he locks up his hut. He goes off with the key. I don't know why we have that little bit of information. <laughs> and he goes to the elders. He looks for the elders. He looks for them in the bamboo grove. He looks for them on the walking meditation path. And he asks them the question about what the teachings that can liberate him. And they say something like, uh, they say, uh, Sawa, Sawa, all the, uh, all formations uh, are impermanent. All dharmas are without a separate self. Nirvana is peace. So he goes to one, then he goes to another, and he, everybody tells him the same. And then he, when he's heard these teachings, he thinks, I'm not really happy about this. I don't really feel liberated. <laughs> because there must be a person who's going to be liberated. And as far as these teachings, it doesn't tell who is the one who's going to be liberated. But then he'd been told about a really good teacher. That is Ananda, because Ananda had been the attendant of the Buddha. So he must have heard everything the Buddha taught, and uh, he was the repository of all the good teachings. So, although it's quite a long time away away, uh, in the Goshita Park in Kosambi, nevertheless, uh, he decided that he will go there to ask his question to Ananda. So, Ananda is a, a, a very good uh, teacher, and uh, the first thing he notices when Chanda comes to him and asks the question is that Chanda maybe lacks a little bit of self-confidence. Chanda says, I've heard this teaching that all formations are impermanent, all dharmas are without a separate self, nirvana is peace, but I don't feel happy about it. Because who is it who is going to feel the peace, who is going to realize nirvana? So Ananda said that Ananda is very happy with the monk Chanda because he is honest and speak out exactly what he feels. So it's sure that he can uh, become enlightened. And so An Ananda will give him the teaching. And uh, the teaching that Ananda gives is word for word the teaching that we have 
in the discourse on the middle way. Yeah. What about right view? And in that teaching, the Buddha says something like, people in the world are caught in the view of being and the view of non-being. That is because they have all kinds of latent tendencies and they grasp to dualities. And the Buddha teaches the Dharma that goes in the middle way, that is neither being nor non-being. <coughs> And uh, it also says that uh, when somebody is able to give up grasping to the ideas of uh, being and non-being, he no longer clings to or believes in a separate self. At, 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 ata me ti. Now, there is a separate self of me. I have a separate self. And that is really the key to Chanda's problem. Because the problem that Chanda has is, who is it? Who is this me who's going to become enlightened? And the, the discourse on the middle way is to remove all ideas about a separate self. And the example that the Buddha gives in the discourse on the middle way is that When the conditions and causes are right, suffering arises. And when the causes and conditions are not right, then suffering is no longer there. You do not have a self that suffers. You do not have a self that ceases to suffer. You just have the suffering. We, this is the, the Dharma seal of no self. You see, all, all the monks, they were teaching the, these, these three Dharma seals. But Chanda, he could not accept, accept because he couldn't understand no self. And no self is so difficult for us to understand. Because from the day we were born, before we were born, we already have the idea that I am a separate self. And our language every day we talk about me being a separate self. So these three, three Dharma seals, they are not just dogma to talk about. They are things we have to practice in our daily life. We need to practice the samadhi on impermanence, no self, and nirvana. The concentration is what we need. Samadhi is concentration. And when Chanda was listening to Ananda's Dharma talk, or really the Buddha's Dharma talk, He's just repeating the Buddha's Dharma talk. Chanda was very confident that he could be liberated. He therefore had a good concentration. And just in the Dharma talk, he was able to see the truth of interbeing. And it was the truth of interbeing that helped him to realize the no-self. And he saw that when the causes and conditions for liberation are are there, then there is liberation. And when the causes and conditions for liberation are not there, the liberation ceases. And in our daily life, we, we need to practice like that. There is another, uh, another sutra, which you may like to read. Um, 
This is the Agama, this is in Chinese, this is the Nikaya in Pali. All the Nikaya have been translated into English. You can easily find all these things <coughs> on the internet. So this sutra is in uh, in Chinese. It's called the discourse on the, gr the sutra on the great emptiness, and in uh, in the Pali, it's called the ending of ignorance. And in this sutra, the Buddha is talking about birth and death, death and old age, old age and death. And uh, the Buddha asks, um, who is it who grows old and who dies? If you can answer that question, you will be liberated from old age and death. And so when I have a toothache, I also have to ask, who is it that has a toothache? Who is it who has pain? And when you look at that question, you answer the, that is the toothache. The toothache, it has the causes and conditions. And as long as the causes and conditions are there, the toothache is there. But there isn't any, I cannot find anyone who has a toothache. And so the same is true with getting old. Who is it who gets old? Normally we say, I am getting old. He is getting old. But when we look deeply, we, we cannot find someone who's getting old. Who is it who dies? You say, I die, uh, or he dies. But if you look deeply, you cannot find that I, you cannot find that he. But you can find death. It's very easy to find a toothache. The pain is very clear. It's, it's really there. But the I who has the toothache, it's very difficult to to find. So this practice uh, is on the samadhi, on no self, is something that we can practice at any moment in our life. The same is true of happiness. You say, I am happy, I am sad. The happiness is very clear. You can feel it deeply. The sadness is also very clear. But who is the I who feel happy? It's very difficult to find. So this morning, I really enjoyed the guided meditation we had before the Dharma talk. Uh, it's a little bit about no self. I can't remember exactly what the words were, but uh, we feel the breathing in, I'm breathing with the Sangha or something like that. And. Uh, then we have something like, breathing in, I smile. Yeah, I don't remember the words very well, but I remember the experience of the meditation. And when I was doing that uh, meditation, uh, I feel that, uh, I hope that when I'm on my deathbed, that there will be one person or two people who are there breathing with me. And then I can say, oh, okay, I'll stop breathing quite soon. <laughs> but they, they will continue to breathe. Because in the uh, teaching we say, when we do the meditation on the, let the Buddha breathe, I don't need to breathe. We, we practice, uh, there is only breathing. There is no one, no one breathing. So this is also a way that we practice in our, our daily life to, to remove the idea of a separate self. And of course it goes along with impermanence because uh, death is a kind of impermanence. And then when we came to the part about smiling, um, I thought, oh, then when I'm, uh, <laughs> when I'm on my deathbed I can smile. And not only because uh, 
I can smile now, but because I have a good example, one of my, uh, my spiritual ancestors, um, Shuba in uh, Vietnam, Shuba Thay Thay Than, Thay Than, yeah. Shuba um, came into touch with the teachings of Plum Village, with the teachings of Thay. They transformed her life. She practiced that uh, meditation, uh, breathing in, uh, breathing in, breathing out, a uh, deep, slow smile, smile release. And it brought her so much joy, so much transformation. And took her through many difficult times because she also uh, used to do a lot of social work and uh, the... Um, the government, the communist government, uh, didn't allow her to do the social work she wanted to do. But anyway, she uh, was uh, very ill, and she knew she was going to die. But she had no fear of dying. She wanted to come very much to Plum Village, and she said that, uh, never mind, in a few days I'll be able to go there, because <laughs> when I die, I will be free to go anywhere. <clears throat> so she practiced, uh, really practiced uh, breathing in, I calm my body, breathing out, I smile. And she said, it's sure that when I die, I will be smiling. And please uh, take a photograph of me, she said to her <laughs> disciples, smiling, and send it to Thay in Plum Village, because he will then know how effective the, the meditation is. So we receive a very beautiful uh, photograph of Shubha lying in the lion uh, posture, on the, like the Buddha when he passed into Nirvana, and smiling after she had passed away. So uh, I enjoyed the meditation this morning very much. Of course, I also enjoyed the chanting because it helps me to be in touch with no self. I don't know if you, who are sitting there, feel that you are no self when we do the chanting. But we who are standing up here, we are meant to be practicing to feel no self. To feel you are there, I am here, because you are there. You are there, and therefore I am here. And at that moment, I feel very free. I can chant with all my heart. But there is no self chanting. There is uh, there my brothers and sisters alongside me. They are part of the chanting too. And you, who are sitting down there, you are also chanting with your with your listening. So if there were no listeners, there would be no chanters. <laughs> if there were no chanters, there were no listeners. It's a time when I feel really the interbeing, the ability to let go of my separate self. So I think this is a, a gift, the coming up and chanting before a Dharma talk. It's a gift that Thay has given us because it's an opportunity for us to be pra able to practice, to get in touch with our no-self nature, our interbeing nature. And sometimes it's a little bit difficult to, as we said before, for us to be in touch with our, our no-self. And that is why we really need to practice the, the concentration on impermanence and the concentration uh, will help us to be in touch with no-self. You are changing at every, every moment. But not, you, not only you are changing at every moment. This Dharma hall we are sitting in is also changing at every moment. And one day when it uh, falls to the ground in a hundred years or two hundred years, uh, that will be the result of the fact that it's changing now. And one day when you lie down on your deathbed, that will be also part of the fact that you are changing now. So impermanence is something that means changing at every moment. There are two kinds of impermanence. There's the impermanence, which is changing every instant, and there is the impermanence that is called periodic 
or cyclical impermanence, when you suddenly see, oh, that person has changed. That person is no longer alive. That person has grown old. Yeah. And that is something we, we see with our eyes. But it's not the only kind of impermanence. So when we practice the meditation, the samadhi on impermanence, it is something that we do throughout the day to, uh, to see that we were not the same person as a moment ago. The person eating breakfast and the person giving the Dharma talk is uh, not, the, not the same. So when you're eating the breakfast, you may say you are the eater. When you're giving the Dharma talk, you may say you are the speaker. The speaker and the eater, they are, uh, are different. And different in time, you can't eat and speak at the same time. So impermanence has to do with, with time. Uh, time is possible because of impermanence, because things are changing. So if something is changing at every moment, you cannot call it a self. A self is something that has to stay the same. You have a feeling that that I had the toothache and this I who has the non-toothache, they are the same I. But that's only a feeling you have. They are not, they are not the same. So what, what about this suffering that has uh, two question marks? Yeah. We have, I feel very lucky. There was a passage in the sutra that used to worry me a lot. I read it and I could not understand it. And I thought, why did the Buddha say that? And then I thought, I must be very stupid. I don't understand what the Buddha is trying to tell me. And I turn it around in my head many times. And this passage in the sutra, I don't know where it is, it's also in the Sam, Samyutta Nikaya in the, in the 22nd chapter. 22nd chapter is about the skandhas, the Kanda Samyutta. And this passage says, monks. Uh, is uh, the body permanent or impermanent? What do you think the monk said? <laughs> impermanent. Uh, yeah. Do you think the body is permanent or impermanent? Blessed one, impermanent. And then, according to this sutra, it said, if the body is impermanent and subject to change, is it suffering or happiness? What do you think the monk said? You know? They said suffering. I don't know why they said that. <laughs> this is a bit I didn't understand. And the Buddha apparently didn't didn't turn a <laughs> didn't worry about the answer. He seemed to accept it. So then say, I used to ask myself, well, why is the body suffering? Sometimes the body has pain, it's true. But uh, for instance, you do total relaxation, the body feels so happy. Or you go for a swim and your body feels so happy. So I couldn't understand why we say the body is uh, suffering. And then the Buddha said, what about feelings? Are they... Uh, Permanent, impermanent. Well, our feelings, we obviously are impermanent. And are they suffering or happiness? Is something that's impermanent suffering or happiness? They say suffering. But we know that many feelings are happy feelings. And impermanence is something wonderful. It's not really suffering. Mm. It makes life possible. Things are so beautiful because they are impermanent. This uh, orchid is <laughs> beautiful because it's impermanent. Because we know that it won't always be like that. That we really get in touch with its beauty. It's possible because it's impermanent. So uh, to say that impermanence is suffering is strange. Impermanence is a Dharma seal. 
It is a fact of life. Life is only possible because of impermanence. And therefore, we have to accept it that impermanence is a fact of life. It isn't suffering. It isn't happiness. Sometimes it leads to feelings of suffering. Sometimes it leads to feelings of happiness. And we are the ones who are responsible for our feelings of happiness and suffering. Uh, when things are impermanent, if we suffer, we can transform our suffering into happiness if we know how to. So impermanence um, can uh, not be made the, the cause, the blame for our suffering. We are to blame for our suffering. So it's a very strange argument, mm, this uh, argument that if something is impermanent, it's suffering. You cannot, this building we're in is impermanent, but you cannot say that this building is suffering. You can't say it's happiness either. So what happened is that suffering got inserted here between impermanence and no self. Because, I don't know when, but after, probably after the Buddha passed away, the monks needed, and the lay people, <laughs> they needed to keep doing the practice. And they knew that Suffering is one of the main causes that makes us practice. It's our motivation. When we suffer, we really feel motivated to practice. So they have to keep reminding themselves all the time. This is suffering, this is suffering. And when they remind themselves this is suffering, they want to practice in order not to have to suffer. So suffering became very important, and so it got inserted into places that the Buddha probably never taught because it doesn't make sense. And we have to be a little bit intelligent when we read the sutras. Edward Conza somewhere says that of all the things that people say the Buddha said in the sutras and everywhere else, only 10%, he believed that the Buddha only said 10% of those. I think I heard Thay one time say that Thay think was probably right. So we have to be look deeply when we read something in the sutra that doesn't make sense to us and not say necessarily I'm stupid or uh, we have to say maybe there's a mistake here. And it's only our deep practice that can give us the answer. It's through practicing the Dharma seals, that we get the answer. And so if we take out the suffering here, of course I don't want to forget about suffering altogether, so I'm going to write it down here. But if we, if we remove it, we have a, a very cogent argument between impermanence and no self. Monks, is the body permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, world-honored Lord. Is what is impermanent and constantly changing a separate self? Or is it no, not a separate self? It's not a separate self, uh, wealth honored Lord. Because how can you call a self something that is always changing? A self is something that has to have an identity. Like uh, Sister Gina said yesterday, the I has to have an identity. I was that person yesterday, and same person today. So this is a very logical thing to say that contemplating impermanence 
we are able to be in touch with no self. And also contemplating interbeing, we are able to be in touch with no self. So I said that we didn't want to forget about suffering because suffering is one of the, no the four noble truths. And the reason why the, the disciples of the Buddha wanted maybe also to make suffering one of the three Dharma seals was because they wanted to preserve the teaching of the four noble truths. They felt that that is a very essential and necessary teaching. But we should also remember another thing, and that is that the, the noble truths are, if they are to be the teaching of the Buddha, they are not the kind of suffering that we talk about in a non-teaching of the Buddha. It's the same with impermanence. Do you think we should hear a sound of the bell? <laughs> Sorry. philosophers have talked about impermanence, like Heraclitus says that you can never step into the same river twice. But that isn't exactly the same as the impermanence that the Buddha talks about. Because according to the Buddha, the Buddha would say there are two reasons why you can't step into the same river twice. One reason is that the river is always changing, the water is always changing. The other reason is that you are also always changing. So you are a non-self. So the teaching of impermanence must include the teaching of no-self. And later on, we will see, it must also include the teaching of nirvana. So suffering, it must include the other noble truths the Four Noble Truths all into R. And that is very clearly taught by the Buddha himself, also in the Samyukta, Samyutta Nikaya, in the Gavampati Sutta, Sutta, where the Buddha says that as wherever there is suffering, there is the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the path that leads to the end of suffering. So say, for instance, you're, you're soon going home. Maybe you have a difficulty with a relation of yours, with your son, your daughter, or your partner. And uh, sometimes you say something. You think what you say is perfectly normal, and it shouldn't cause anybody a problem. But your son or your daughter... <laughs> They react very strongly when you say that and they say something very in unkind to you in reply. So you say something, he says something. Or it could be your mother or your father. <laughs> you say something you think is quite normal, but then your mother or your father say something you feel unkind in reply to what you said. They react to what you said. And then you react to what they say. You react by saying something more or you react by having a strong feeling of uh, dislike or hurt or something like that. And this is something, it's like a cycle. Uh, he says something, you say something, he react, you react, and it goes around and around. And it happens many times. It hasn't only happened once. So the saying of the words you say and the other person say, they are like the second noble truth. They are the cause of the suffering. And the feeling that you have when you hear those words and the reaction is the suffering. And that is the first noble truth. So the first noble truth has its, 
has its cause. And then one day you, you sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil and you write down, when you say this, I react by saying this or doing this. The result is that I suffer in this way, you suffer in that way. So when you've written down those two points, you've written down the first noble truth and the second noble truth. So now you have to go to the other two noble truths, the fourth noble truth. Usually the second noble truth comes first, the cause of suffering, and then the, the suffering, and then you have to find the path that leads to the end of suffering to be followed by the end of suffering. So then you sit down and you think, how can I react differently? So that is the noble eightfold path, the path. There is right thinking. I can think differently about what that person is saying. I can look deeply into why that person says that. Or I can practice that is right thinking. Or I can practice right speech. I can go to that person and I can share. Every time you say that, <laughs> I react. And I know that reaction makes you, you suffer. So uh, I'm going to practice not to react like that. And you share like that, and that will help the other person. And then you practice right action, which is when that person says that, you follow your breathing, you smile, and you think, I don't need to react. That person is suffering, has some history that makes them speak like that. They're not trying to do me some harm. So with that, it's the Noble Eightfold Path, and then you have the end of suffering because you practice the Noble Eightfold Path. It's very simple, these four things, they inter are. As soon as the suffering is there, the other three are, are there. So that is suffering according to the Buddha. And if you make suffering one of the three Dharma seals, or one we call four because we're going to see we really have to have Nirvana. If you make suffering one of the four Dharma seals, you make the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the path that leads to the end of suffering, you make them Dharma seals at the same time. So this suffering is the kind of suffering that we talk about when we chant the insight that brings us to the other shore are also uh, ill-being, the cause of ill-being, the end of ill-being and the path are also not separate self-entities. So in that way, if we want, we can put the suffering in as a Dharma seal on condition, that is, the suffering that inter is with the other three parts of the four noble truths. So now is the difficult bit. <laughs> Nirvana. So we said that when Chanda went around asking the monks what, what are the, the Buddhist teachings, they always added Shantam Nirvana, that Nirvana is peace. And then, thank you, Tathai, Tathai reading the... Uh, the Mahaprajna Paramita Shastra of Nagarjuna, which was written probably in the second century of the Common Era, uh, discovered that uh, Nagarjuna says that the three Dharma seals of the Buddha are impermanence, no self, and nirvana. Apart from those two 
places, the Chanda Sutra and the commentary by Nagarjuna, we do not find, or we have not yet found, any other place that says the three Dharma seals are, include Nirvana. And all the other places, they say that the three Dharma seals, or they sometimes we call the three signs, Ti Lakana in Pali, are impermanence, suffering, and no self. And the argument that uh, I started to tell you will say that things impermanent, therefore they are suffering. If they are suffering, they cannot be a self. So that also for me was always very difficult to understand uh, why if something is suffering, it can't be a self. You suffer a lot because you're a separate self <laughs> rather than you're happy. Anyway, that is the argument. Maybe because they were thinking of self in the terms of Atman, an Atman in the uh, normal Indian way of seeing it, as the, the soul, the immortal soul. Mm. So that's probably why they say it can't be suffering. Mm. <clears throat> so impermanence and no self are things that we can recognize in the historical dimension. We can see uh, that things are always changing with our intellect. We can see that uh, if we didn't have food to eat, if we didn't have our mother and our father, we couldn't possibly be there. So we can understand uh, no self and impermanence intellectually, and we can understand in the historical dimension. So impermanence and no self are like on the same level, and suffering is also on that level. Suffering is something that uh, is relative and is there along with happiness. So nirvana is like on a different, uh, a different level. Because impermanence and no self, we can conceptualize. And nirvana is called peace. It's also calling, called the silencing of all words and concepts. So nirvana isn't something we can conceptualize. So when we use uh, concepts, we often think in terms of opposites, like life and death, before and after, uh, coming and going, same and different. So we take the last of those opposites, <laughs> same and different. And there is a meditation that you've probably done. Um, Breathing in, I'm aware of my back. And uh, breathing in, I see that my back is my father's back. Because from my father's uh, sperm, all the chromosomes that make my back possible have come. So my back is my father's back. And breathing in, uh, I'm aware of my lungs, and breathing out, I see that my lungs are my father's lungs. Because if my father's lungs weren't there, there are no way my lungs could be. So I see I am sitting with my father's back, I am breathing with my father's lungs. So this is a meditation that is really to help us with no self, to see that I am not a separate self apart from my, my father. And generally, people have the tendency, especially if they don't particularly like their father, to think that their father is someone completely different from them, that they could be there without their father. But when they do this meditation, they have to see that no father, no, no me. And the same you have to do with your mother. 
So this is a meditation that helps us overcome the concepts of not the same, of, of the same and different. So normally we think we are different from our father. We have to do that meditation because different is an extreme. It's like out here. And same is another extreme. And we have to do that meditation to push us out of the extreme, into the middle way. Uh, be careful, don't go to the other extreme <laughs> and think that you, you and your father are exactly the same. They also cause you suffering. So push you out into the middle way, into the middle of the stream. And the problem is with the teachings of the Buddha, sometimes it te push from, you take the teachings in the wrong way, they push them from one extreme to the other. Hmm. Like the, the, the Buddha wants to teach no birth and no death. And then people uh, push from the stream of, of, of birth and they go in right in the other direction and they say Buddhism teaches eternal death. They cannot get into the middle, <laughs> the middle between. And these meditations are not to push us into the opposite, but to push us into the middle. And that middle way is nirvana. You cannot, you cannot talk about it in concepts, because our concepts are same or different. We don't have something, <laughs> a word, a concept that can express the middle way between same and different. And that is nirvana. And that is why nirvana is absolutely essential. Because it's what you stop you falling into no self. The Buddha helped you to get out of self, and then you get pushed into the other extreme of no self. But if you'll be able to go beyond concepts, then you can dwell in the middle way. And uh, that is what the Buddha's teachings are for. They are a medicine. Uh, they are not an absolute, absolute truth. And the Buddha also said, if you get stuck in the idea of self, the Buddha has a teaching for you to get out of it. But if you go get stuck in no self, the Buddha doesn't have any teaching to help you get out of it. So the Buddha would prefer you stuck in self than you stuck in no self. And uh, the same is true of uh, impermanence and, and permanence. Don't get stuck in impermanence. Be, and then you say, oh, life is so miserable, it's not worth, not worth living, everything is impermanent. But we've already said that uh, impermanence is uh, not the uh, opposite of continuation. There is a there is a continuation. You think about yourself when you were five years old. Probably during this retreat, you have done the meditation on yourself as a five-year-old child. And at that time, it's so easy to get in touch with yourself. You know the kind of feelings, perception, body that the five-year-old child had. And you can still touch that deeply. And not only can you touch your own five-year-old child, you can touch your mother and your father's five-year-old child. So that, uh, that means that you're not completely different. Huh? You're not, that uh, you're just the continuation of that five-year-old child. Yeah, it's still very alive. And this comes back to what we were talking about in the beginning, the three times, uh, the three times into our the past and the present into are. You are what you are now because you were what you were when you were a five-year-old child. So every day we have to be in, just as every day we have to be in touch with impermanence and no self. When we are in touch deeply with impermanence and no self, we automatically touch nirvana but we can no longer give it uh, words. And then we have to come out and uh, give it words. When we're in touch with the uh, interbeing deeply, and it goes beyond words, it becomes a 
direct experience, then we're in touch with nirvana. So I think nirvana, it needs a, a dharma talk of its, of its own. So uh, we have to, some of us have to go back uh, home today and we have to go back to our work. And uh, some of us work with the, with the sick, some of us work with the dying, some of us work with those who are mentally disturbed. And while we are here, we have, uh, some of us work for the environment, many different kinds of work we have. And while we are here, we have learnt uh, certain ha new habit energies. Habit energy of stopping when we hear the sound of the bell. The habit energy of always coming back to our footsteps when we are walking. And our workplace, <laughs> our work, it really needs those things. And the greatest gift, uh, your way of saying thank you to Thay, is to take these teachings back to your, your workplace. And of course, you can't be 100% perfect um, all the time, mindful. But you can organize your life. You can use your creativity in order to change your workplace, change your life. And you have little things you do, like your walking meditation from the bus stop or from the car park to your office or the bell on your computer, the use of the telephone or the red lights when you are driving your, your car. I so like the red light when I'm a passenger in someone's car. <laughs> Whenever I see a red light, I think, oh, that's the Buddha help us both to come back, the driver and myself, to come back to our mindfulness. And I feel disappointed when the light is green because we don't have a, a chance to practice. Mm. So there are many little things. Every time you uh, get into your car and you turn the key... I don't know, you don't do that anymore, do you? <laughs> you push the, the key in or something. You push it in halfway, and then before you push it fully in, you meditate, where am I going? The car and I are one. The car goes fast, I go fast. So many little things that can change you and bring a change into your workplace. And maybe the most precious of all is your smile. When you smile, all your ancestors are smiling, smiling with you. And your smile, it, it is a real transformation that takes place in your unconscious. It send, your smile sends a message to your, to your brain and say everything's okay. So with the smile, your parasympathetic nervous, nervous uh, system, it can uh, operate much more easily. If you uh, have an angry face or a miserable face, your sympathetic nervous system it's more likely to come into operation. And a colleague who's so difficult at work, just give them a, a smile, a real smile from your heart. And you can only do that when you've understood their difficulties, their suffering, that making them a, a difficult person to work with. Nirvana, the ultimate dimension, is a place for us to come back to every day. Even in the uh, midst of a busy time, in the midst of a not very peaceful meeting, you can uh, close your eyes and uh, be in touch with your mother in yourself, your father in yourself, 
and through that meditation on your inner being, you can touch your nirvana nature. You already are nirvana. Everything is already nirvana. We don't have to go somewhere, <laughs> do something. It's just that we're not in touch with it. And by practicing to be in touch with impermanence and no self, uh, you will be more easily in touch with nirvana. <laughs>